Moving water does some very interesting phenomena. It automatically sorts things. It can form five or six layers simultaneously. There's a good videotape called Experiments in Stratification that shows the top strata can actually be older than the bottom strata. If, it's, if the water's moving, it forms multiple layers simultaneously. Moving water does some strange things. How many have ever seen those things you buy at the store with two pieces of glass and different colored sand in between, and when you flip it over, it forms all these layers real quickly, okay? It doesn't take a long time. Stratification can happen very quickly. Underwater landslides, like the one we saw in Indonesia in 2004, <clears throat> can cause, uh, it's called a turbidity current. They can do enormous damage underwater, causing tsunamis on the surface, which kill 250,000 people. In 1929, there was an underwater landslide that traveled 70 miles an hour, cut two transatlantic cables. That one landslide covered 40,000 square miles. That's about the size of Ohio. One landslide underwater. As the, during the flood, the water would be swirling around, and the dead animals would tend to, you know, get caught in these little swirls called eddies. This happens today. If you walk along the river, you see the river moving one direction, but along the sides, there's little eddies, swirling water. This would happen on a global scale during the flood of Noah. As the animals would float around for a few weeks, they would rot, and their head falls off, and tail falls off, and legs fall off. And when they finally get buried, you end up with tangled up messes of dinosaur bones. Notice these backbones here have no head attached, no legs, just the backbone. Underwater landslides do enormous damage, and surface uh, animals buried on the surface under mud can be entangled up messes. Fossil graveyards are very common all over the planet. They found a concentration of fossils like logs in a log jam. If you go to um, where San Jacinto Monument in Texas, where Santa, uh, Santa Ana finally met his, met his match when the Texans caught up with him, the whole monument is made out of fossils. I mean, you look at the blocks of rock, it looks like great big blocks of stone, and they are. As you get up closer, there are bazillions of little tiny fossils in them. Here's a four animals that are found fossilized in the swimming position. Their head held up high out of the water. I believe they probably got caught in the mud as the water settled, as the mud settled out of the water, and they drowned or died in the swimming position. In one place in Africa called the Karoo Formation, they said there are 800,000 million skeletons of vertebrate animals. A lot of animals died at one time. They found iguana skeletons in a, uh, iguanodon skeletons in a Belgian coal mine extending through 100 feet of rock in the vertical position. Hmm. Up in Canada on Axel Island, they find petrified redwood stumps. You can go to Axel Island. There are no trees on Axel Island. There are certainly no redwood trees growing there. How do we get fossilized redwood stumps on Axel Island? People say, well, hey, doesn't it take millions of years for things to petrify? No, things petrify quickly. There are scores of examples can be given where things have petrified in less than 100 years. Okay? Two horse hoofs were found petrified in Oregon. A petrified water wheel shown here in this picture. Just the minerals replaced the wood. Here's petrified firewood. Here's a fishing reel stuck in a rock. They said the rock was 300 million years old. By the way, if any of you students want to make some money, University of Chattanooga, Tennessee, University of Tennessee at Chattanooga studied this thing talked to the guy who owned it and analyzed the whole thing and said, man, this is amazing, a reel stuck in a rock. If you can locate the owner of the reel and get me in touch with him, I want to see if he wants to put it on loan in our museum. And anybody who can find me, the owner, uh, Dan Jones, find me the guy, get me his phone number and let me talk to him, I'll give you 50 bucks. For fine, do some research if you have sleuths up here in Tennessee you want to work on that one. UTC geology experts can't find, to explain this. Why? How could a fishing reel be found in rock? If you go to Waycross, Georgia, they've got on display there at the Southern Forest World a mummified dog stuck in a tree. The dog apparently chased a coon up the tree and got stuck, and the dog is mummified. The tree was still alive. They named the dog Stucky. Here's a petrified cowboy boot with the cowboy's legs still in it. Article's on the table down there called The Limestone Cowboy. Here's a petrified fish giving birth. Here's a petrified hammer found in Hawaii. A petrified hat found in New Zealand. Petrified crayon found in Arizona. Petrified pincushion found in Wisconsin. A guy got found along the, uh, a beach in Montana, uh, was petrified, petrified man. Here's a story about a petrified man uh, in Gainesboro, Tennessee. 
The guy died in 1881. They buried him. 14 years later, they were going to bury his wife next to him when she died. They dug a hole for Grandma's grave, and water seeped into the hole, into the grave. They said, oh, we don't want to bury Grandma in the water. So they buried Grandma someplace else. Then the kids got worried about Grandpa buried in the, in the water. So they dug up the grave. The body inside had turned to stone, except the arms had rotted off. The rest of the body had petrified in 14 years in a coffin in Tennessee. The man found in Fort Benton, Montana, it was in 1897, found by Tom Dunbar. The guy was five foot eight. Many medical doctors examined it, said, man, this is a petrified, complete human. Not the bones, the complete person, petrified. A lady in Sao Paulo, Brazil was 62 years old. She went to the doctor and said, I got a pain in my side. The x rayed her and found a petrified skeleton of a baby inside. She was pregnant and didn't know it. The baby had died and turned to stone inside the woman's body. It does appear the baby was about to be born, the doctor said that examined her. I talked to a guy from Maryland. He said, yeah, I drove the ambulance. We took a woman to the hospital one time in Snowden, Washington. There's his phone number there if I talk to Brian. He, she said, uh, she was taken to, he said she was taken to the hospital and they removed a petrified uh, fetus from this woman. It had turned to stone in her body. Here are petrified sacks of flour found in Eureka Springs, Arkansas. Here's a petrified pickle found in Montana. This is in my museum. It was found in this jar. The guy sent it to him. He said, Brother Hovind, I found a petrified pickle inside a jar. The lid rusted off. Would you want it for your museum? I said, of course. Who in their right mind would not want a petrified pickle for their museum? Here's a petrified toadstool just south of Bloomington, Illinois, in an amazing museum called the uh, Funk Gem and Mineral Museum in Shirley, Illinois. If you ever drive out there, stop and see that place. A kid, this kid in the picture here sent me these petrified acorns. He's seven years old. He said, Brother Hovind, I put, these ac I put the uh, acorns in a bucket of water hoping they would sprout, and I forgot about them. A year later, when Mama found them on the back porch, they had turned to stone in a bucket of water. Petrified acorns. Here's petrified peanut cluster in the Ripley's Museum in, uh, t in Florida. Here are petrified charcoal briquettes. We've got them in our museum. Come down to Pensacola and see the petrified charcoal briquettes. Here's what appears to be a petrified coconut. The whole thing is in our museum in Pensacola. Here's the fossilized arm to an octopus I referred to earlier. This is a replica of it. Petrified octopus arm. There's an article in Family and Handy Farm Devices, published 1909, on how to make petrified wood. For centuries, people have known how to make petrified wood so it will last longer. People say, now wait a minute, aren't the fossils of similar animals found in the same layers? Doesn't that prove, you know, evolution? Because reptiles are found in the same layer. Well, if there's any sorting of the fossils, it's not proof of evolution, that's for sure. Actually, the textbooks teach the layers are well sorted, and it's simply not true. This guy, David Ropp, he's a professor at the University of Chicago, I believe. He says, <clears throat> one of the ironies of the evolution-creation debate is that creationists have accepted the mistaken notion that the fossil record shows a detailed and orderly progression. And they have gone to great lengths to accommodate this fact in their flood geology. The layers are not in the orders they would like you to think they are. Niles Eldridge said, uh, we date the layers by the fossils, and we date the fossils by the layers. It's circular reasoning. If there's any sorting to the fossil record, it's better explained by a flood. See, moving water in a flood situation does all sorts of interesting things. There's a phenomenon called cavitation which is what happened at the Glen Canyon Dam in Arizona. The water got moving too fast and it sucked the sides of the rock right off the canyon wall. Within just about 20 seconds, it made an area the size of a basketball court four feet thick, four feet deep, sucking rocks right off the side because of cavitation. There's another phenomenon called hydraulic plucking, as in addition to abrasion, moving water in the flood would pick up debris. And it's not just water moving now, it's liquid sandpaper. It's got gravel and rocks and mud and, and tree stumps and stuff in it. It's going to erode right through solid rock. It's going to abrade its way through rock. Also, there's a phenomenon called liquefaction. Liquefaction happens when sand grains are pressed and then the pressure is relieved. If you go out to the beach in Pensacola, walk out into the surf and stand there knee-deep in the water and just, just stand there for a while. As the waves come by, the high part of the wave weighs more than the low part of the wave, obviously. There's more water there. So the high part of the wave pushes down on the sand under your feet. When the low part comes past you, the pressure is relieved, and sand grains start hopping up off the bottom as the water squeezes out of them. 